After four attempts to negotiate the surrender and retrieval of the civilians entrenched at the Alcazar of Toledo with its 1,300 nationalist defenders, the desperate Republicans contemplated their last resort, blowing up the legendary Alcazar with mines. The siege had been going on for almost three months. It had achieved limited results for the Republicans, despite outnumbering the defenders six to one. On September 18th, the Republican president approved the destruction of the fortress. From an observatory, the president and his cabinet waited for the explosion. When it came, and half the fortress became rubble, the Republicans launched a large-scale attack to capture it once and for all. But the entrenched defenders were ready to fight to the last bullet, of which they had none to spare. Toledo, a historic city located on a rocky promontory surrounded by the Tagus River in central Spain, has been a strategic point for centuries. Fortified naturally by its location, it played an important role for the Romans, Visigoths, and Moors. In 1085, King Alfonso VI of Castile reconquered Toledo during the Reconquista, making it the most significant social, political, religious, and military center in the kingdom. In the 13th century, King Alfonso the Wise chose it as the home of the School of Translators, a symbol of the fusion of Christian, Arab, and Jewish cultures. Sitting at the highest hill in the area and boasting a commanding view of the city, the Alcazar of Toledo Fortress is a square fortified building with four imposing towers. Each side of the fortress is 60 meters long, and each tower is 60 meters high. The Alcazar has been heavily altered and restored over the centuries, and has had varied occupants, ranging from Charles I's personal residence to military barracks and an academy. This rich history has made it one of Spain's most important locations. During the early 1930s, the Alcazar of Toledo became the location of one of the first large-scale battles of the Spanish Civil War. Spain was split between different ideologies with religious and political agendas, from monarchists, conservatives, and moderates to liberals and communists. The country was going through social turmoil during the Second Republic. The elections of February 1936 brought to power a leftist government led by the Popular Front. Right-wing forces united and responded on July 17, 1936, with an army mutiny and a coup. The streets of Madrid and other Spanish cities became a war zone. Meanwhile, in Spanish Morocco, a group of generals led by Francisco Franco rose in arms to fight the leftist Republican regime. As Franco readied his forces to cross North Africa and reach Spain, a group of nationalist soldiers at Toledo doubted the coup's success. Although half of Spain had taken arms, the government at Madrid did not fall to the nationalists. The military governor of Toledo and head of the Central School of Gymnastics, Colonel José Mascardo, began to order all the troops available in his province to concentrate on Toledo. As the fighting intensified, the war ministry of the Republican government repeatedly tried to obtain ammunition from the arms factory of Toledo, but Colonel Mascardo refused. On July 20th, the Republicans dispatched some 8,000 men to Toledo to remove Mascardo from power and obtain valuable supplies. The colonel, loyal to the nationalist cause, gathered over 1,300 men and prepared for combat on July 21st. Mascardo's forces comprised 410 soldiers from the Toledo garrison, 110 militia, 90 enlisted men, and four companies of the Guardia Civil, roughly 690 men, under the orders of Colonel Pedro Romero. The Nationalists had over 1,200 rifles, 13 Hotchkiss machine guns, 13 submachine guns, two artillery pieces with over 50 projectiles, two mortars with 50 rounds, and 250 hand grenades. The Republicans dispatched a garrison of some 8,000 troops, including Confederal militias and anti-fascist workers. Besides artillery pieces, the Republicans deployed several armored cars and three tankettes. On July 21st, Mascardo declared a state of war in Toledo and distributed his forces in key city sectors 
as the Republicans surrounded the outskirts. Most nationalist forces took positions at the Alcazar, the arms factory, and the Tavera Hospital. The vanguard of the Republican army, led by General José Riquelme, clashed that very same day with the Guardia Civil at the Tavera Hospital. Here, the Republicans were repelled by coordinated machine gun fire. During the encounter, Commander Ricardo Villaba and one of his captains heroically left the safety of the hospital walls. They threw several explosive charges at one of the advancing armored cars, rendering it useless before it breached the defensive perimeter. Despite emerging victorious, Villaba orders his troops and allied civilians to withdraw to the Alcazar to prevent being overrun. Meanwhile, a Republican column marched to the ammunition factory to parlay with the 200 Guardia Civil troops defending it. Riquelme's troops tried to negotiate with the civil guards before entering combat. While the conversations ensued, the guardsmen secretly sent several ammunition cars to the Alcazar before destroying the ammunition factory and retreating with the rest of the nationalist garrison. Over a thousand armed men, 600 civilians, including women and children, and some leftist hostages were now behind the thick walls of the Alcazar. General Riquelme ordered Mascardo to surrender the imperial city. Still, he blatantly refused, replying the Republic was now under the hands of Marxism, and none of his men would bend the knee to the enemies of Spain. This gave way to the siege of the Alcazar. It was surrounded by over 2,500 Republican soldiers in artillery, which began a preliminary bombardment. On July 22nd, Commissar Candido Cabello, head of the workers' militias, telephoned Muscardo to threaten him. The commissar explained that his 24-year-old son, Luis, had been detained and gave Muscardo 10 minutes to surrender in exchange for his life. According to the operations diary of the Alcazar, written by one of Muscardo's assistants, the colonel told his son to commend his soul to God and be a patriot. His son, Luis, bravely agreed with his father. Following this, Muscardo told Commander Cabello he could spare him the 10 minutes for the Alcazar would not surrender. Furious by this response, the commissar kept his word and the siege continued. On July 24th, his men led an operation outside the fortifications to gather food for the besieged. Although successful, the nationalist soldiers took the life of a renowned leftist journalist, Domingo Alonso Jimeno, in retribution for Mascardo's son. The colonel was furious when he was informed of this, as he never ordered any sort of reprisals. This led Muscardo to several lapses of depression as the siege dragged on and the situation worsened for the defenders. During the early days of August, the Republicans dispatched more artillery pieces to destroy the Alcazar. The artillery barrages, starvation, and mounting losses led to desertions from the nationalists. Barbed wire and searchlights surrounded the four walls to prevent any incursions from the interior. Nevertheless, the defenders held their ground and successfully repelled 11 Republican assaults. They failed to capture the house of the military government, which would have given them an edge, allowing for the placement of troops 40 meters away from the Alcazar. Most nationalist forces began eating livestock, including horses, to survive. Water began to run short as well as the ammunition from the mortars and artillery pieces. On August 22nd, aircraft from General Franco airdropped a supply package with food and letters to contact Franco's troops. Muscardo was praised by Franco and urged him to continue fighting. The Army of Africa, under his command, was advancing from Extremadura toward Madrid to help him. Reinvigorated by the good news, the starving defenders continued fighting the waves of inexperienced Republican militia. On September 9th, as the walls began to crumble, Republican Major Rojo was dispatched to the Alcazar to ask Mascardo for surrender and liberation of the women and children. The colonel refused, but requested a priest be sent to him to say mass and baptize some children born during the siege. The purpose of the evacuation was to leave the nationalist soldiers alone so that the entire fortress could be destroyed with the remaining defenders still inside. Nevertheless, 
Republican President Caballero ordered his troops to continue the mission and approve the detonation of a mine below the Alcazar. On September 18th, the President witnessed the explosion from an observatory. The entire Southwest Tower was destroyed and turned into rubble. Almost immediately, the Republicans launched four attacks with armored vehicles. Despite being outnumbered, the Nationalists put up stiff resistance and drove them off. The bombardment turned merciless and targeted the Alcazar from all sides. On September 23rd, the Republicans attacked the courtyard, where the surviving Nationalists were entrenched. A tank decimated some fortifications, but Muscardeau and his men held tight, pushing back the fierce Republican attack. All waves were pushed back by the exhausted defenders. On September 27th, when the Republican garrison was informed of the advancing army led by Franco, it decided to launch a desperate final attack. All the troops overwhelmed the less than 800 able-bodied men. Mortars, artillery, grenades, and walls crumbling resulted in little visibility and fierce close combat. Fortunately for Muscardeau, the Army of Africa arrived in time for the relief effort. The Republican order crumbled, leading to an unorganized retreat. The Alcazar of Toledo and its defenders had survived, but at a high cost. Besides the casualties, the Alcazar was almost destroyed. When Muscardeau greeted Franco, he said, quote, No further news in the Alcazar, my general. I gave it to you destroyed, but with its honor preserved. Two days later, Franco was proclaimed the leader of the Nationalist forces. In October 1940, Heinrich Himmler visited the ruins of the Alcazar as part of his diplomatic visit to Spain. The heroic defense of the Alcazar would be used for propaganda for the rest of the Civil War and Franco's reign.